Greetings, this is Greg. As with most human endeavors, in regards to flying airplanes, experience is of some value. As a general rule, experienced fighter pilots in World War II vastly outperformed inexperienced fighter pilots. Context matters for this discussion, so please understand we're talking specifically about World War II fighter pilots and measuring success by the numbers of airplanes shot down. If we look at the backgrounds of the top fighter aces of the war, we start to see some common threads. A disproportionately high number of the most successful aces had a very high experience level before going into combat. First of all, many of them were pilots or at least had flying experience in the civilian world before joining the military. Of those who were not civilian pilots, many were military pilots before the war started, typically having started flight training from around 1934 to around 1937. In some cases, the U.S. aces had some sort of additional training by foreign air forces which were involved in combat before the U.S. officially entered the war. In other words, one way or another, the highest scoring aces very frequently had some training and experience level well above and beyond what was the norm. Furthermore, among U.S. aces, it wasn't unusual to see some sort of scholastic background in aviation, indicating a deeper than normal understanding of just how airplanes work. We also see a very high number of musicians and martial artists among the ranks of U.S. aces. My theory about that is that flying, music, and martial arts, which in the U.S. in those days usually meant either boxing or wrestling. Anyway, flying, music, and martial arts are all things which are part art, part science, and part physical. Let's take a look at some of these aces so you can understand what I'm talking about here. I'll start with Pappy Boyington. He was either the first or second highest scoring U.S. Marine ace of all time. I'll get into that discrepancy soon. He seems to be known as a hard drinking and hard brawling character, and he was, but what isn't often talked about is that he had a degree in aeronautical engineering and was employed as an engineer for Boeing before joining the Marine Corps. He started flight training as a U.S. Marine in 1936, then resigned his commission to join the Flying Tigers in China. So by the time he returned to the Marine Corps in late 1942, he had been flying as a military pilot for about seven years, and that included time as an instructor and in combat with the Flying Tigers. So by the time he went into combat with the Marines, he was already highly experienced, certainly much more so than any pilot just out of flight school. Furthermore, he had the advantage of gaining knowledge with the Flying Tigers on just how to combat the Japanese. He was also a wrestler of considerable note. Now let's take a look at Joe Foss, who is also sometimes considered the highest scoring U.S. Marine ace. That discrepancy is because some of Boyington's kills were while flying with the Flying Tigers. So while Greg Boyington's total number of kills is higher than that of Joe Foss, Foss has more kills as a Marine. I'm not sure any of this matters, but some people make a really big deal out of it, so I thought I'd clear it up. Joe Foss started flying as a civilian in 1938 and had about 100 hours of flight time as a civilian before joining the Marine Corps. 100 hours is enough to be a reasonably competent pilot. It's not enough for bad weather flying or going into combat, but it gave him a huge head start in his military flight training. He was also a boxer. Again, a lot of the U.S. aces were boxers or wrestlers. Thunderbolt ace Robert S. Johnson was a civilian pilot before the war. He started flying when he was only 12 years old, paying for the lessons himself by working eight hours a day for a cabinet manufacturer in Lawton, Oklahoma, my home state. That uh, little story there really tells how much times have changed. Anyhow, his civilian flight experience, in my view, gave him a really good head start on his military training, and I think gave him a big advantage over other typical aviation recruits. He was also a boxer. Robert S. Johnson was one of the highest scoring U.S. aces in the European theater, possibly the highest, depending just how you look at it. Then we have Francis Gabreski, another Thunderbolt ace, and along with Robert S. Johnson, 
was one of the two highest scoring U.S. aces in the European theater. Gabreski started flying as a civilian and apparently got off to a pretty rocky start. His instructor thought he didn't have what it took to be a pilot, and his initial flight training in the military didn't go that well either. I've actually seen this before. Back when I was a flight instructor, and this was a long time ago, um, I noticed that some people definitely take longer to get the hang of certain things, but sometimes those end up being the people that go farther um, once they actually do get the hang of whatever it is they were having trouble with. I actually have an explanation for this, but it's really long, so I don't want to go into it. Gabreski took a position, once he was uh, officially a pilot with the military, as a liaison officer for a Polish squadron serving with the RAF. He flew with them on missions and Spitfires, and even went into combat with them on at least one occasion. Thus, when the U.S. started sending fighters over to Europe, Gabreski had a huge head start over the other U.S. pilots in terms of experience, especially in terms of experience flying in the European theater. And he had learned from actual combat veterans on just how to fight the Luftwaffe. It seems that his flying skill had also increased dramatically. Robert S. Johnson said that Gabreski was the best pilot, the best he ever met. And that says a lot coming from Johnson. Richard Bong, the all-time U.S. ace of aces with 40 kills, has a story much the same as the others. He took an interest in aviation from a very early age, and yet is another one who became a civilian pilot before joining the military. As far as I know, he was not a martial artist, however, he did play ice hockey, so I'm counting that. He was also a musician, so he doubly counts towards my part art and part science theory. I obviously can't go over every high-scoring U.S. World War II ace, but I've looked at a lot of them, and experience level seems to be the single strongest common thread. Of course, there were some aces who didn't have any extra experience, but relatively few, especially when we consider that the vast majority of World War II fighter pilots were recruited and trained during the war with no prior flying experience. And that vast majority is hugely underrepresented among the top aces, which really lends, to its, lends itself to the idea that experience level was the most important thing. I'll mention two more pilots before I talk about the aces of other countries. And uh, apologies in advance for mispronouncing names. Some of these things are very hard to pin down. Uh, Hub Zemke was the leader of the 56th fighter group in Europe. Jimmy Doolittle called Zemke his greatest fighter group commander, high praise indeed. Zemke not only had a lot of flying experience, having started in 1936, but he served as a liaison to the RAF early in the war and then went to the Soviet Union to teach the Soviets how to fly P-40s. I have to think that he picked up some useful information on both of these assignments since both of those air forces he went to work with had experience fighting the Luftwaffe. Uh, Zemke was another boxer. The leading U.S. Navy ace was David McCampbell. He started flying in 1937, thus was quite experienced when the U.S. entered the war officially at the end of 1941. This trend of uh, high experience being relevant isn't something we only see with U.S. pilots. It was true across the board, at least to the extent that I can tell. Now, in certain countries, civilian flying probably wasn't, in, wasn't much of an option. And in some cases, it's very hard to come by information on uh, pilots' early lives. But let's take a look at the, some of the top aces from various countries. In no particular order, I'll start with the leading French ace, Pierre Klosterman. He earned his private pilot's license in 1937 and worked on his commercial license in Los Angeles shortly after that, so yet another civilian pilot. Ultimately, he joined the Free French Air Force and became one of the most successful Allied aces of the war, not just the most successful French ace. I'm not going to go into much detail about each of these pilots. Keep the context in mind here. I'm just trying to solidify my point that experience level was the strongest determining factor in the likelihood of becoming a high-scoring ace. I'm not trying to argue that so-and-so was the better fighter pilot than the other guy or that one pilot's claims were exaggerated or underreported or whatever. For purposes of this video, that stuff doesn't really matter. 
The leading Finnish pilot was this fellow, I'm going to try the pronunciation, Omari Jutilianen. He started flying in 1935. The leading Italian ace was Teresio Vittorio Martinoli. He required his, uh, acquired his glider license in 1937. I don't know when he started with powered airplanes, but he started flying in the military in 1938, so certainly no later than that. The leading Australian ace was Clive Caldwell, another one who learned to fly as a civilian, in this case during 1938. George Burling, also the knight, uh, known as the Knight of Malta, was the leading Canadian ace. He's another one who started flying as a civilian pilot. In fact, by the time he was 16 years old, he had 150 flying hours, which is a lot for that, uh, for being 16. His whole story is particularly wild, even by the standards of this group. The top British ace, Johnny Johnson, yet another who started flying as a civilian. Robert Stanford Tuck, Britain's second highest scoring ace, started flying in 1936. Ivan Kozadub was the highest scoring Soviet ace and the highest scoring Allied ace of the war. He's another one who started flying as a civilian before the war, and the same is true of the number two and number three Soviet aces. So I'll be covering this in an upcoming episode on the P-39, which will loosely tie into this video because, um, well, the Soviets flew the P-39 to great effect. The German aces fall in line with this trend as well. The all-time ace of aces, Eric Hartmann, learned to fly as a civilian, got his glider's license at only 14 years of age, and his pilot's license a few years later, just before the start of the war. There are just too many German aces to go through, but huge numbers of them started flying before the war, giving them an edge and experience over others. Furthermore, a lot of them fought in the Spanish Civil War or learned directly from those who did. Of the top 10 Luftwaffe aces, seven of them started flying before the war. I find it fascinating that those seven are also the only ones in the top 10 that survived the war. The three German aces in the top 10 who started training last are also the three that perished during the war. I don't think there was much civilian aviation going on in Japan prior to World War II, but with Japanese aces we see the same trends the most successful ones start flying pretty early. Of course, in this case, it's not only due to experience. By 1943, it was very hard for a Japanese pilot to survive. So hard that any Japanese pilot starting training in 1942 was not likely to get very far in his career as a combat pilot. However, some Japanese aces did fly through those years and survive the war. In those cases, they are usually pilots who started flying pretty early. Uwamoto started flying in 1936, Sakai in 1937, so they were both highly experienced pilots before Pearl Harbor. I think the data clearly shows that pilot experience was a big factor in the success of World War II fighter pilots, and it's something we need to keep in mind when comparing the combat results of certain airplanes. It's possible for one pilot group to succeed with a plane while another fails, largely due to the experience level of the pilots involved, either the pilots flying the plane in question or the opposition. Now, you might tend to think that more experience results in higher kill numbers simply because they were in the war longer, thus had more time to rack up a high score. In other words, someone who started shooting down planes in 1939 had more time to do it before the war ended than someone who started in 1943. Well, the problem with that theory is that the U.S. aces didn't fly for the entire war. They flew for some period of time or number of missions and were then sent back home. Yet we still see this trend with the U.S. aces with about the same regularity as we do with the Germans, who flew until death or until serious injury prevented them from doing so. There seem to be a few other factors that show up quite frequently among the high-scoring aces. Um, I mentioned music and martial arts. Playing rougher sports seems to be common traits in this group. Uh, rougher sports would be things like rugby, ice hockey, football. Now that's not to say that it was the people that excelled in these sports that became high scoring aces. Interestingly, that's not the case at all. In other words, it's not that top level boxers or wrestlers are likely to make great fighter pilots. Maybe they will, maybe they won't. 
It's just that the data shows that great fighter pilots seem to be the type that often get involved in those sorts of activities. That doesn't mean that they're the people that had some sort of natural ability in those, in those activities. Interestingly, academic success in high school and college seems to provide absolutely no indication of success as a World War II fighter pilot. I'm honestly not at all surprised by this, and it's clear as day when looking at the data. The list of top aces has people in it that did pretty well in school and people who did very poorly in school. Of course, acceptance into aviation programs sometimes requires some amount of scholastic success. For example, there are some cases where college degrees are required to get into certain programs, but once in, it seems to make no difference. The people with degrees don't do any better than people without degrees in, in terms of uh, this discussion. The only scholastic accomplishments that do seem to show up with some consistency among the top aces are in areas that pertain specifically to aviation. The best example is Greg Boynton's experience as an aeronautical engineer. Uh, David McCampbell, the top U.S. Navy ace, also had uh, an engineering degree, although it wasn't aviation specific. Even success in flight school doesn't seem to be too much of an indicator. Uh, many of the top pilots had problems in flight school. These include Francis Gabreski, Werner Molders, and even Richthofen back in World War I. Flying is a learned skill. Some people learn it faster than others, but that doesn't seem to mean that the people that start off slowly won't ultimately catch up or even get ahead of the curve. So that's all I have for now. I know this was a short video. I'll have a bigger, better one up soon enough. I want to thank Flightline Media Channel for uh, the pictures of the U.S. Spitfire model. I'll link the video for that model build here in the description. Thanks to all my subscribers and special thanks to all my supporters on Patreon. It's you guys who make this channel possible. Oh, before I go, I want to mention I'm flying on the DCS simulator these days. That's Digital Combat Simulator. I switched from IL-2 because DCS is just better for my purposes. I'm not going to get into why that is. There are plenty of channels that do comparisons. The problem is that DCS updates so often that those comparisons are out of date in a month or two. So if you've looked at DCS before, you might want to take another look now. For example, the 190 Dora 9 was simply broken in DCS for years. Now it's fixed, and it's an amazingly accurate representation of the airplane. There are many good offline missions for it, and quite a few online arenas where you can fly it against real people. I'm flying it online on the Wolfpack server using the Normandy map. I'm on this server for some very specific reasons. First of all, it has the Dora. Some servers don't. Of those servers that do have the Dora, many don't allow its use of MW50 for some reason. Viewers of this channel know that the Dora is set up largely around that MW50 system, and without it, it's just not a match for a Mustang or Thunderbolt. However, with MW50, it can give those planes a pretty good fight, or it can give a pretty good fight to almost anything in the sky. So any server that has Doras without MW50 just isn't worth flying from my point of view. Another issue is that some servers place the Doras at bases so far from the front that it takes 20 minutes by the time you start up and take off to get anywhere near the action. I don't have all day to fly the sim, and if I've got an hour, I don't want to spend a third of my sim time doing stuff that I could easily do offline. I also like the Normandy map the best. The channel map is good too, no question about that. But the Normandy map, I feel, has a little bit more going for it. More airfields, front lines closer to bases. Uh, maybe I just like it more. I don't like servers that have icons. Um, I think hunting down other airplanes and looking for them is a big part of the challenge of flying a realistic sim. And also, I like to change my airplane's paint scheme and loadout. So the Wolfpack Normandy server has all of these things going for it. It has the map I want, no icons, it has doors with MW50 based, not too far from the front, and I can, figure, can configure the plane as I desire. So I hope to see some of you there. That's all for now. Thanks to all my subscribers, and special thanks to all my supporters on Patreon. It's you guys who make this channel possible. Goodbye, and have a great day.